What happens when police don't believe your right to self-defense? I've seen some crazy examples when self-defense can go terribly wrong. And if the police don't believe you and your story, you could even end up in jail. So don't make these four mistakes when claiming self-defense, especially the last one. We've all been there. We're driving down the road, minding our own business. Suddenly, some idiot comes speeding past us, cuts us off, pulls out in front of us and slows down and gives us the middle finger. Maybe they even pull up next to you and slow down and start threatening you. Then it maybe causes you to start speeding up in their direction. The two of you start exchanging comments and the next thing you know, you're both speeding down the highway. Now let me insert a real case that we saw. The aggressor who started the whole thing gets out of his car, pulls out a knife and puts it down to his side and starts threatening him. Our client runs back to his car, gets in and locks the doors. But then the original aggressor then gets in his car and speeds off. So what do you think our client did? Our client then proceeded to chase after him to a second location. But this time when they both got out of the car, the aggressor didn't pull out the knife this time, but our client had none of it. He approached him and then put a beat down on him because of the original altercation. So who got arrested? Our guy. Why? Because he didn't have a bruise on him and the other guy looked like he had lost a boxing match to Mike Tyson. The police then had a problem with our client escalating the conflict. The problem was the police did not believe our client initially when he claimed that he was in fear for his life and that's what led him to put the beat down on this guy the second time they stopped. They didn't believe what he said because the original aggressor didn't pull out a knife the second time. Generally speaking, there must be some type of immediate threat. Our client needed to experience some imminent threat of immediate danger. He must also have felt like, based upon the actions of this other guy, that he felt like he was going to literally be placed in fear of serious bodily injury or death if he didn't take the action he took. The problem? The police will not believe you were in fear for your life, which then necessitated you using a gun or a weapon or even non-deadly force if there was no specific threat or the use of a weapon in that second encounter. In other words, the prosecutor and the cops are not going to believe you if you're chasing down the guy who caused the road rage and originally threatened you. In our case, if our client had immediately defended himself when he first saw the road rage guy come out with a knife, we would be talking about a totally different story. Was our client right to be mad about this idiot cutting him off and causing this road rage incident? Absolutely. But it was important that he either showed some restraint or he acted immediately when he was placed in imminent threat of serious bodily injury or death. Number one, road rage incidents. Number two, failing to call 911. Someone pointed a gun at you and threatened to kill you. You then pull out your gun as well, which then leads to the entire situation start to de-escalate. Should you still call 911? Absolutely, you should. The reason why is I see so many people making the decision, well, now that the entire situation is de-escalated and it's not as serious as it was, maybe I don't need to call 911. It's critical that you call 911 in this situation. This happens all the time when I see these crazy people pull a gun on someone and then the whole situation starts to de-escalate and people decide they're not going to do anything about it. The problem is if you don't call 911 and make it very clear that you were in fear for your life, particularly if you had a weapon and you pulled it out as well, then guess what's going to happen? The original aggressor, they're going to call 911 first and get their story to the police from the very beginning. Police then show up and who do they talk to first? They talk to the so-called victim, which was the original aggressor, not you. Now the police label you as the original aggressor and they come to you beginning to interrogate you about what really happened. And now you could end up in jail. But why? Because many times police believe if you didn't call and report the incident, then you weren't really in fear for your life at the time. So you must be the initial aggressor. I have seen this happen thousands of times. If you have actually been the victim of the crime, it's important that you get your victim story in first. So that way the police will know you were not the aggressor, but you were the one who is in absolute fear for your life. By the way, here's a tip. If you end up being in a self-defense situation and you see the police showing up, and they begin to size up both parties and separate you, and you start getting this gut feeling that the police are already making up their mind, you must have done something wrong. Remember, exercise your right to remain silent, 
exercise your Fifth Amendment right and your Sixth Amendment right to counsel, because if they start interrogating you and not allowing you to tell your story, there's a good chance they've already made up their mind that they think you are guilty. Number three, let's say you tell the cops, I wasn't afraid of him anyway. Let's say someone was shot or injured and the police show up and start asking questions. One of the first things they're going to do is go to the person who has the gun. So if you're there and you acted in self-defense and you have the gun, here's the problem. They're going to want to talk to you. And if you start saying things like, well, no, I wasn't really afraid of him anyway. I was just doing what I did to protect myself. He was running his mouth and I didn't like his attitude. Be careful. The police won't like this and this can absolutely hurt your self-defense claim. Think how easily it is you undermine your entire self-defense claim. If you pull out your gun and you shoot at someone, or you take a knife and you stab someone, and you say you weren't really afraid of them anyway. So you really acted in self-defense? You really weren't afraid for your life, but you used a deadly weapon anyway? Of course you were afraid for your life. This is no time to act like you're macho. It's important to make it very clear, if you are the victim, you acted in self-defense. I actually represented a military veteran one time that got into an encounter with his neighbor. Now I'm talking about my client was a serious military veteran. Green Beret, literally served in Vietnam. We're talking about the cream of the crop. Well, the neighbor came at him and had a kitchen knife and started threatening him, saying he didn't like it when he was over on his yard. And so what did our client do? Our client had his knife that he pulled out and immediately put it up next to his neck, put him in a submission mode. And then the moment that the police showed up, what did our client say? He said, I wasn't really afraid of him anyway. I've trained for these situations. It really wasn't that big of a deal. Of course, the problem now is that the cops didn't believe our client's claim of self-defense. This made it way more difficult for us to argue this to the grand jury when he was charged with aggravated assault deadly weapon because he just said he wasn't in fear for his life. You must establish that you believed the use of the aggressor's deadly force placed you in fear of imminent serious bodily injury or death. But if you say that you use deadly force because you thought you were about to be killed, but then in the same breath you turn around and say that you really weren't that worried about him, you are going to destroy your self-defense claim because the police are only going to hear that you didn't have any immediate fear. Now, not only should you be careful what you tell the police after an encounter like this, you need to also be careful what you tell everybody else. I've seen people involved in self-defense situations like this that after the altercation is over, they go around to their friends, their families, maybe even their neighbors, and the first thing they tell them is, you know, look, I had that situation completely under control. At no time did I think he was going to really do anything to me. And then guess what do you think happens? The police go around and start asking everybody else questions, particularly witnesses, maybe other family members. And now what do the police hear? They hear other witnesses saying that you specifically told them you were never really afraid and that you had the situation under control from the very beginning. This is dangerous. Nothing is hidden in today's world. When you start sharing information like that with other people, social media posts and other people will snitch you out as quick as can be when the police start coming around asking questions. Keep your mouth closed. Bragging about how you handled a self-defense situation will do nothing but destroy your self-defense case and land you in jail. Finally, number four, don't leave home if you don't have to. You see something going on over at your neighbor's house. You can clearly tell that someone's breaking into your neighbor's home. So you call 911. You go over, you confront the burglars at your neighbor's house. They then try to push past you. You turn around and shoot them. Is this self-defense? I can guarantee you the cops will arrest you and most grand juries will actually indict you. Why? Because cops will not like the fact that you left the safety of your own home to go out and initiate an encounter with an aggressor. You have to be very careful using deadly force with property only, particularly if it's someone else's property. When you go out there and engage someone that is on someone else's property, it's very difficult to argue that you were in fear for your life. Look. As a practical matter, we've tried a number of self-defense cases, and many jurors are looking to see if there was a safe alternative available as opposed to someone initiating deadly conduct, especially if 911 tells you not to engage them. Trust me, I absolutely know. 
In states where there is stand your ground, you've got the castle doctrine, you certainly can protect your own home, you can certainly protect yourself, but I want you to understand, when these sort of situations end up in trial, many jurors are looking to see if you chose the most reasonable, safe alternative. So the moral of the story on this one is, if you leave the protection of your own castle, many times the cops will choose to arrest you and not believe your self-defense claim. And by the way, if you liked this video, YouTube thinks you'll really like this video. Give it a click and I'll see you over there.